Welcome, everybody. I'm really excited to be here. This is my second slush. My first one was back in 2022. And when I came in 2022, I didn't get to see the sun the entire time. So I was really happy to arrive here on Tuesday, uh, where we had a beautiful blue sky day. And now, of course, the, uh, the event has really been living up to its name. We're going to talk about two things today. The first one is how to think about pacing your early growth targets, your early investment targets, and your early kind of expense and, and investment strategy. And then the second one is how to eventually then transition through those early growth stages toward profitability. Now, before I get started on that, I wanted to lay down a little bit of a foundation. So I figured that we would start with a, a nice photo of uh, me and my uh, co-founder and Braze's CTO today, John Hyman. Uh, this is the two of us all the way back in 2011 in a, uh, our, our second ever office. The first one we never paid rent at, we were squatting. Uh, so this is the first office we ever paid rent for. You can see the beautiful bare concrete floors uh, that we were working with in tight quarters. And in 2000. 2011, you know, if I bring you back, uh, July 2011 when we started, was the very early days of the app stores. There was a lot of excitement around smartphones. We had tremendous conviction that smartphones were going to change the world. Um, but it was very much the early days both for consumer acceptance as well as building businesses in them. Now, when we look at the space of customer engagement that Braze is in today, and we map it all the way back to those early convictions, we started out with two things. The first one was that new brands, you know, or new startups, would be born and built to be mobile first. This is obvious now, but at the time was fairly controversial that people would start out building a company and they would only build a mobile app in order to service it. We wanted to look at how the world was changing as a result of this new smartphone technology, both for consumer behavior as well as the opportunities that it was going to create for new startups and businesses and brands. And we wanted to build for them to be able to be more sustainable businesses. The second one was that the enterprise would then get transformed by this wide-scale adoption of mobile. Now we fast forward to today, and smartphone technology has deployed more widely than any technology that's ever come before it, including clean water and grid electricity. And it's fundamentally transformed every aspect of our lives. And so when we look back on assumptions like these in 2011, they feel a little bit quaint, right? Like these things feel obvious today. Um, but as you'll see, as I kind of walk through our journey, there was still years before this meant that we were able to build a viable business under these convictions. Now, the second part is that we chose to start Braze to build a sophisticated product. We wanted to build something in a space that didn't exist yet, but was still premium, that took a more advanced technology approach than other, uh, other kind of technology companies, specifically in the marketing space, had been in the past. We were built on top of real-time stream processing technology, and we were the first to do that in our category. Now, in order to make a bet like that, in order to say, hey, we're not just going to enter a space that doesn't quite exist yet, we're actually going to assume that when that space comes into existence, it's going to reward people that are taking a more premium and a more advanced approach. There's a prerequisite to that that I, I wanted to leave everyone with. And that's when you think about how the space that you're trying to attack or the opportunity that you're trying to tackle is going to evolve over time, for us, we had conviction that the complexity of that problem space would increase as new businesses were built, as markets were transformed, as consumer behavior continued to change and people and institutions responded to that. And also that the reward for solving that complexity would increase over time, which for us you know, meant two things. First, that businesses who increase the sophistication of how they talk to their consumers, of how they communicate with them over time, of the level of personalization that they would strive to get to when they're communicating with people through things like marketing campaigns would continue to increase. And the brands that did a great job of it would be re rewarded with customer loyalty and with a you know, growing and evolving business. And then the second one was that customer engagement technology and then the teams that use it would co-evolve to drive high levels, higher levels of impact over time. And that co-evolution is important because when we look at Braze's customer base today, many of the job titles that we sell to didn't exist when we started the company. And many of the budgets that we occupy were not line items in many marketing budgets when we started in 2011. 
And what that meant is that not only did we need to be able to grow as a business, but actually the marketers that use Braze soft, Braze's software had to gain new skill sets. Their org charts needed to change over time, and in many cases, new budgets needed to be allocated. And all of those things take time. Now, if we fast forward to today, Braze is a global company. We actually just hit our three-year anniversary of our IPO on Sunday. And you know, today I have over 2,000 customers. We're over 500 million in ARR, um, almost 1,700 employees around the world. But I'm not here to talk about who we are today. I want to talk about how we got there. So let's zoom in on two different stages of our growth that I think are, are pretty interesting to look at. The first one, you know, we went from 2 million to 20 million in ARR, uh, precisely like 8xing it in about two years. So this is a really rapid phase of early growth. But the interesting thing about this chart is that it doesn't start in 2011. It actually starts in 2015. It took us four years of building and getting to that first 2 million before things finally started to take off. The next phase, we 7xed in the four years that followed that. And that got us halfway to the scale that we eventually had when we IPO'd. Now, when we look at these two periods, it's pretty interesting to see, you know, obviously we've got this kind of early inflection and in growth, and then we're able to sustain and compound that at scale over time. And of course, the seed of that opportunity was born from this, wide, this rapid growth in smartphone technology as the app stores are introduced and as the early days of mobile really starts to gain steam. And now this that's on the screen right now, this idea that when the pace of change accelerates, it creates opportunity is, is very obvious right, to all of us. We look at how is new technology being developed and how is it being introduced into the market? How is it being adopted? How is that transforming the industries that we're selling to? And all of those create disruption and room in the market that we can take advantage of. But it's an interesting question to say, which pace of change? Like, where do we actually build a sustainable business? Because if we look at, let's look at two charts here. The first one, global smartphone sales. So you can see in the middle there, 2011, where the, the little uh, Braze logo is, that's when we were founded. And that is inarguably a point of acceleration, right? This is the, um, the number of smartphones sold in a given year through this time period. So obviously that point of acceleration was an opportune point for us to start the business, but it's kind of interesting to see that actually in that whole phase where we got to half of our IPO scale, not only did global smartphone sales start to level off there, it actually started to slow down. So you might say, okay, that's interesting. If the pace of change and that kind of acceleration is what creates the growth opportunity, well, what the hell is going on here? The answer is that it's not that early phase of change that we were building for. We were building for businesses to be built in mobile. We were building for teams to become more advanced in customer engagement. And we were building for the enterprise to be transformed. And so the more important chart to look at was not just these early smartphone sales. It was actually something more like this. This was app store revenue through the same time period. So even as smartphone sales annually was slowing down, what we saw was that the businesses that were being built around this space were starting to gain momentum. And so when we look at that 20 million to 200 million phase off of this graph, it makes a lot more sense, right? But the other really important thing about that for all the startups in this room is that the beginning of this chart was six years in to our journey which meant that we needed the investment capital that we had in those early days to be able to allow us to still exist six years into the journey. And so one major takeaway of this is that in these early areas of disruption and this acceleration of change, there is tremendous opportunity that gets created. But your conviction and your business and your focus might need to last years longer than you were expecting in the early days. Now the great thing is that if you build for the change that's going to endure, not just that early change that you see as new technology gets deployed, but what's gonna happen afterward where budgets get created, new skill sets are invested in, new teams get formed, businesses reorganize, consumer behavior changes, institutions respond, businesses get built. Those are all the kinds of things that create enduring change that you can build a sustainable business around. 
Now we've all seen some version of this quote and it always gets misattributed to someone smart. Um, I've tried to do my best to go and actually find the original source of it all the way back in 1981. Uh, and this basically says that we underestimate change in the near term and we, or we overestimate change in the near term and we underestimate it in the long term. And I think that you know, when you look back on, on these charts and reflect on Braze's journey, we were definitely an example of that, right? Four years until we hit that two million point, but then rapid acceleration starting even six years in. So how do you take an insight like this and then actually apply it to how you think about your early investments and the early expense culture that you have around your business? What is the right speed to grow? Now I wanted to uh, tell a, retell a story that I was told or a lesson that I learned earlier in my career. So I spent some time working at a hedge fund right before I started Braze in 2011. And in the early uh, kind of new employee onboarding, they have a talk from one of the chief investment officers and he goes up on the whiteboard and he draws out these three curves of three different investments with their return over time and asks the room, you know, of these three investments, which one would you choose? And on the surface, it kind of feels like a, it's a case study in risk tolerance, right? Or volatility, like how much are you willing to kind of tough it out in order to maximize your return over time? But it ends up being a trick question because letter A, if you're a hedge fund, is the only one where you're still alive at the end. If you're letter C, sure, you grow really quickly in the early days, but when you plummet back down below the line, all your LPs pull out of the fund and you don't actually have any assets under management in order to kind of live to see that second resurgence. If you're letter B, you grew too slowly for too long and everyone gave up hope and you didn't actually have the opportunity to kind of get to that point. The only real answer was A, because that was the one that actually had sustainable growth, where you could build a team, you could build the confidence of your investors, and you could, you could continue to sustainably grow your return over time. I think this is perfectly analogous to how we think about startup growth as well. You know, if you look at letter C, we all know plenty of companies in Brace certainly had competitors that were characterized in this way, where they raised substantially more money than us in their early seed rounds, their series A and their series B rounds. But because it was too early still, those businesses hadn't really matured and evolved in the mobile space, they set their expectations for growth too high. They burned that candle very brightly in the early days, and then when the growth was unable to be sustained, the expectations plummeted, their early teams left, their salespeople got discouraged, their investors didn't want to do follow-on rounds, and it ended in you know, disaster or consolidation for them. Similarly, there's probably a bunch of companies that were like B that didn't go out and raise money in the first place. They didn't, you know, they didn't, uh, they didn't prioritize growth enough in those early days and we've all never heard of them because they never made it out of that inflection point. But the companies that stick around are the ones that follow that letter A. Now let's dig into this a little bit more. Uh, anyone that's taken a macroeconomics class might recognize these as being kind of similar to supply and demand curves. And the, the thing I like about this particular uh, model for thinking about the early days of any sort of market that we're trying to sell into is that that concept of inelasticity exists in here. So what you're looking at is on the y-axis the amount of money that you'll spend to gain to access a market. And so basically as you move up this curve, the y-axis says how much incremental money you need to spend in order to sell an incremental amount to the market. So in the early days of a market where you don't have budget line items yet, you don't have those skill sets, the companies that you're selling to are not as developed or not as numerous, or maybe you know, they're, they're not as dense in the given geography that you're starting in and you need to be out foraging around the entire globe in order to find people to sell to, it's very, very expensive for you to be able to grow. There's that incremental unit of, uh, that incremental unit of new sales costs a lot. Now over time, as the market matures and develops, as more of the ecosystem starts to center around you, you know, as new budgets get carved out for your category, um, and as your own awareness increases in the space, it becomes easier to sell. And so in this model, you can think about it as like, you know, year two for us was that purple line. We could try to pour a lot of new venture capital into the business, but the market just wasn't ready for it yet. And you know, now more recently, as we, you know, as we IPO'd, as the awareness grows, as these new job titles and new 
new team structures come into play, as new budgets get allocated, that supply curve swings out and we're able to sell to it more effectively and more efficiently. So I know this is a qualitative model, but the key takeaway is in, in a given space or in, and in a given kind of year within the categories that you're growing into, I think it's really important that you calibrate your investment level to kind of live right before that curve starts to go vertical, right? The whole point of venture capital is that you're able to get out on that curve a little bit, right? You don't need to live in the, in the area where the marginal uh, market that you're able to access you know, is highly, highly efficient you can burn some money in order to get up that curve, but try to stay before you start to really go inelastic on it. Now, the next stage of this is really thinking about what causes that curve to evolve over time. And I mentioned a few things that you know, characterize that evolution for us, but I think another really useful model, and if you actually take the, the little dots here as they're growing, turn them on their side, and kind of flip them over for me, they're going to map onto this, which is probably a curve that many of you have seen before, the technology adoption curve, right? So in the early days, you're selling to those innovators. The innovators have, you can imagine that curve, right? The ability to then sell to the late majority or the conservative buyers when you're still in the innovator stage of a new market, it's extremely expensive. But over time, you develop that ability to move from the innovators to the visionaries and then into the early and late majority where you really start to be able to grow the bulk of your business. Now, if you've studied this adoption curve, and if, and if you haven't yet, I highly recommend that you do, um, you'll know that you can't usually skip these steps. You're learning about new things about your market as you go over time. The early adopters are willing to be risk takers with you. They're the ones that are gonna kind of develop those new skill sets. They're gonna be the evangelist for your new category. They're gonna help you spread your new startup ideas out into the market and really help you build that flywheel over time. And then eventually, as that social proof starts to develop, that's when you get to sell into the majority. Those are people that are not as comfortable being on the leading edge. They want to make sure that other people have proven out that your software or your product um, or your service is going to work before they take the leap on it. But the good news is that those people are also willing to pay you more money. Right? When you get into that part of the curve, that's where you're able to really start to kind of build a higher margin business, do so in a way that helps you build momentum. And so the takeaway here is that you know, it is really fun to sell to the early adopters, those innovators, those visionaries, but you can't get stuck along the progression because you need to get into this meaty part of the curve where there are many more businesses and there's a higher willingness to pay. And so as you think about that model then, that area under the curve matters a lot because that's where you really get the bulk of the business. And if we go back to the Braze example, that early two to 20 million, that was in those early days with those early adopters. This 20 to 200 million is when we start to get into that early majority. And now Braze today is very clearly selling across that entirety of the early and late majority adoption curve. And so when we think about that from a scale perspective and from a startup perspective, I think there's also really important implications to your product strategy, which is that you need to always be thinking about what that next stage of your customers is also going to be de demanding that it's entirely possible the early adopters are not actually asking for. And that's what I mean by that point of not getting stuck. You need to be building, certainly, and listening to customer feedback. But there are things that characterize your early adopters that are fundamentally different from people that exist in this middle of the curve. And if we think about the bulk of the business that we're going to build over time, most of it's going to come from this mainstream market. And so make sure that as you're building out your new product and your go-to-market strategy, that you're certainly looking to that early stage to get you through those early stage of, stages of growth so that, you know, in our case, you can survive those first six years. But make sure that you're not over-indexing on the feedback from them if it doesn't actually resonate with what's going to come out of the mainstream market. And to just put some numbers on this, I thought this was kind of a, an interesting comparison when we looked back on our own journey. When Braze raised our Series A, the scale of our customer base was only 1% of what it was when we IPO'd. 
And so I get asked a question from startup founders a lot where they're like, hey, I have this great new enterprise customer. You know, they're one of our first 10 or first 20 or what have you, and they have all these custom requirements, and we're really trying to decide, you know, should we build for them or should we be building for, you know, the, the kind of next stage or what have you? And, you know, the, the answer is like, Sometimes you do need to build for that early enterprise customer. You really want the logo. You want them to be a great reference customer. You want the, you know, you want to, maybe you still need to vet out some aspects of the product that you're building and you think they might be a good case study for what future customers are. But don't lose sight of this grounding fact. Because the whole reason that you're raising venture capital is so that you can be looking further into the future. You don't need to bootstrap off of each one of those early customers. And you need to keep that in context to know that you know, if all goes to plan, if you continue to build and grow into a generational company, the size of the future customer base is going to be orders of magnitude larger than the starting customer base. All right, so now speaking of getting to be a generational company then, let's transition into the last topic, which is what growth at the right speed then means for profitability throughout this time period? And you know, I think that this is an evergreen topic, but it's obviously uh, been a, a little bit more in the headlines over the last couple of years as the market has shifted from its valuing of growth at all costs to really valuing profitability over time. Kind of of the, the school of thought that businesses should make money. And so I've always felt that uh, the, the fact that we had to make a shift toward caring about profitability was a little bit insane. Uh, but you know, that actually meant that, well, you know, Braze went through the shift. The way that we had been running our culture the whole time meant that, well, we did have to make a shift in our priorities. We didn't have to make any sort of big cultural shift. It wasn't a seismic change in the way that we ran our business. And I'm sure that we've all seen examples of companies over the last you know, two and a half, three years in particular, where their shift from growth at all costs to moving to profitability was extremely painful. They lost a lot of employees along the way. They lost a lot of leaders. They had to change almost everything about the way that they were working. And so if you have one takeaway from you know, my, or like one takeaway from my, our, my own wisdom on this kind of shift from growth to profitability, it's that prepare your culture for it in advance. That balance between growth and profitability is way more achievable if it's been something that you've been talking about the whole time, if it's been something that you've instilled in your culture where you have a value-oriented expense culture and investment philosophy for everything that you do. Now, of course, this doesn't mean don't go and burn money. It doesn't mean don't go and find venture capital. That's the whole idea behind really modeling out these curves and understanding how you get up higher on them over time, how you buy yourself time to be able to do meaningful R&D while a market is still developing. You know, one of the things that I didn't share is that, of course, well, it did take us four years to really start to hit that revenue inflection point and another couple years before we hit scale. When we got there, we had six years of R&D head start on everyone else that was suddenly picking up their head and noticing that there was a business opportunity there. And that six year R&D head start was only made possible by investing and by burning money. And so this doesn't mean you know, be so oriented toward value that you're always profitable, but it does mean that every investment that you make should always be grounded in value even when you have money available to you. Another important aspect to this is sustainable sales practices. We see a lot of examples of companies that do really unsustainable things when they are incentivizing their sales team or they're incentivizing customers, all sorts of crazy free giveaways or you'll agree to any payment terms or you're giving you know, massive discounts just to be able to get into a certain category. And yeah, I mean, sometimes it feels good to get those reference customers, but think about what that means for your sales culture. You train an entire generation of salespeople to be able to hit their number by taking shortcuts effectively. And then one day you wake up and you say, hey, we got to be profitable soon. It's time to stop taking shortcuts, except you've trained an entire sales team for years that it's not only OK to take shortcuts, but they've been getting rich doing it. And so that then leads to this need for like seismic change. You're going to turn over big teams. You're going to lose that, uh, that experience and that knowledge that's in your organization along the way. And so if you want to be a company that's prepared to be able to turn these dials as you need to kind of react to new fundraising environments or new macroeconomic conditions, you need to have these aspects in your foundation to make sure that all of your leaders around the company and all of your go-to-market leaders are operating in a way that's fundamentally value-oriented and sustainable. 
Another way of putting this is that burn is sticky, right? You can train yourself to take shortcuts. You can train yourself to not think deeply about the ROI on investments that you make. And many of the expense lines that exist in a business tend to have momentum in them. And so these three words are ones that were repeated over and over again by one of my board members in our early days. And every time we started to kind of look at new, like more extensive secular investments, you know, certainly we chose to do some of those. But this reminder was always provided that burn is sticky. So if you remember, you know, one thing from the tail end of this talk, it's just these three words. The next one is to make sure that there's alignment around these things. A lot of times, especially for the founders in this room as a CEO, you're thinking about all these different scenarios and you're prepared for them and you're prepared in your own mind to be able to pivot through them. But think about how jarring it might be for your teams to be operating one way for years and wake up another and there's a new message from the CEO and the CFO that they need to kind of change everything about the way that they've been working. It's really critically important, I think, that when we have conversations around you know, growth and profitability and balancing it, that these different scenarios that might play out in the fundraising environment, in our, you know, our own ability to penetrate a new and evolving market as we're growing our customer base, and in the broader macro environment, that the different possible paths that, are, that we're going through, that we might go through, are shared amongst our leadership team and that there's something that we're talking about. And then the last thing that I wanted to leave you with at a talk that's been really focused on efficiency and thinking about you know, sustainable value-oriented culture is a little bit of a caveat at the end, which is that no matter what the flavor of the month is for investors, even if it is to become very profitable, remember that it's not that, it's not that efficiency that's gonna compound over time. It's growth that compounds over time. And so make sure that no matter what you're doing, you're not starving that engine of growth. We're all here at a conference that's you know, flooded with investors because venture capital is an extremely useful ingredient into a new and growing company. And so make sure that yes, you remain value oriented, keep in mind that burn is sticky, and make sure that you're having that conversation in your own leadership culture, but never forget that revenue growth is what really compounds and what's gonna drive you into being a generational company. Thank you, everybody.